My family moved across the country when I was five from Tucson, Arizona, where I was born, to Auburn, Alabama, where I grew up. And those of you who have completed any sort of long haul move know how difficult it can be. My parents had to figure out how to transport belongings, clothes, toys themselves, and two children across five states. They ultimately decided that the best way to do so was by train. So they shipped all of our belongings ahead of us, but the four of us got on a train and traveled for several days. And this was in part a philosophical decision, actually. My parents felt that it would be too abrupt to get on a plane in Arizona and then get off in Alabama and have everything change that quickly. They wanted a slower transition, one in which we could all literally watch the landscape shift and change. I was only five, so I can't remember if this eased my personal transition, but now that I'm an adult, I understand their choice. Transitions are just hard, even when they're transitions that we're undertaking by choice, even if it's a transition where the circumstances are changing for the better. There was wisdom in taking a longer route between point A and point B. It gave my family, or at least my parents, space to process what it was that they were leaving behind and what it was that they were moving toward. The Israelites in our text today are in a similar position, although their journey in the wilderness takes far far longer than a train ride. They are en route from point A to point B, and they're in a space of processing, of reflecting, and of learning. It's a space with which I hope we all can identify. We're certainly all in the transition space of hybrid worship. Many of us are in spaces of personal transition. And then there's also this larger transition of church. This church and the church writ large from what it was in prior years to what it will become in what I really consider to be a new era of church life. I hope we can identify with the Israelites because they're too often set up as a negative foil. I'm grateful to Han for their sermon last week and bringing in some of that context of how Christianity often talks about Judaism and can often set it up as sort of a negative example. And in this text, particularly, the Israelites are often characterized as whiny, ungrateful, and blind to the work of God in their midst. They're an example of what not to be. But as is often the case, the text is more complicated than that, and we learn more from the story if we can locate ourselves within it rather than standing self-righteously outside of it. If we look closer, we see that the Israelites are in transition from the only life they have ever known. They are traveling across a wilderness for an indeterminate amount of time toward a promised location that they have never seen. And to make matters worse, they are hungry. Is there anyone who gets upset when they're hungry? I get really upset when I'm hungry. <laughs> and I see a few hands waving. But the Israelites, they're not just 
I'm stuck in the airport hungry or dinner is running late hungry, but we're completely out of food hungry. If you've ever spent any time in any sort of wilderness or the wild, you know that food stores are critical. The Israelites aren't just grumpy or hangry. They are in danger. Therefore, their complaining is legitimate. And they do complain. The scripture tells us that they complain against their leaders, Moses and Aaron, and they complain against God. I imagine that any one of us would do the same in their position. So as scholar Sarah Koenig writes, the central issue of today's passage is not that the Israelites complain and grumble. Rather, the central issue is faith. That's what's at stake in this passage. What does it mean to have faith or to develop faith in God? The Israelites in this moment, lack faith in God. I don't say that as a judgment. We all likely experience lapses in faith. It's part of being human. And I think it can especially happen when the world has shifted around us. The Israelites, they're uncertain and they lack faith in a God that they're actually still getting to know. If you look at this in the context of Exodus, this wilderness relationship, it is still in its infancy. But you see, the lack of faith starts to pull them in a tempting but dangerous direction. They quickly slide from legitimate complaint to nostalgia. They say, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt when we sat by our cooking pots and ate our fill of bread. It sounds nice, right? To sit by a pot that's full of good smelling food and to eat until you're full and sleepy eyed. But remember that nostalgia is a slippery slope. It's good and it's important to look back at what has happened and to think about fond memories, but nostalgia can also paint them with a soft and generous brush, often alighting important details. The truth of the matter is that yes, food was likely more readily available for the Israelites in Egypt, but it came at the cost of enslavement. In Egypt, they could not just eat whatever and whenever and however much they wanted. The Israelites were an oppressed people. They were forced to labor and they were often beaten by their overseers. That is why they left and fled in the first place. So again, let's see ourselves in this story. We too can start to over-romanticize the past. We too can stumble in our attempts to move forward because we're constantly looking back. So what does God do here? What does God do with these grumbling, nostalgic, very human people? What does God do with a crisis of faith? God uses it as an opportunity to teach. God uses it to, as one scholar put it, help the Israelites knock down the mental frame of oppression and pick up the life of liberty. How does God do this? Well, God stays present to the Israelites, literally present. God appears as this cloud and says to Moses, I've heard the complaining of the Israelites. We can imagine a few different tones of voice there, right? Maybe 
God is a little annoyed, or maybe God is like that exhausted but ever loving parent saying, I've heard the complaints. And God says to them, At twilight you shall have your fill of meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. God stays present, and God provides for the Israelites in a way that meets their emotional, their mental, and their physical needs. Think about it. First, God says, I hear you. That's meeting an emotional need. Have you ever experienced that? The difference it makes when you're hurting and someone says, I hear you. I see you. I acknowledge your pain. This tells us that God cares about and wants to meet and provide for our emotional needs. Second, God gives the Israelites a plan. I love a plan. And plans, structure can help meet a mental need. God tells the people when and where food will be provided. And it's not random. It's not a one-time thing. God says you can count. You can rely on food in the evening and food in the morning. This tells us that God cares about our mental health. And third, God gives the Israelites real food. God doesn't stop at the acknowledgement of their hunger. God does something about it. And you know, sometimes us humans are bad at this. We see that someone is hungry or we see that someone is sick and we acknowledge it, but we stop short of actually meeting the need. Sometimes as a society, we say instead, oh, well, your health was really your personal responsibility. Or, well, you really should have worked harder and earned some more money for that. Or we'll feed you, we'll house you, but only if you meet certain requirements. That's not how God works, which is good news for the Israelites. And it's good news for all of us. God cares about and provides for all of our needs, emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual. I said just a minute ago that God uses this opportunity to teach. And you see, God's provision to the Israelites comes with some instructions. The people are given bread for each day with a double portion for the Sabbath, but nothing more. They are instructed to take only what they need. They are not to hoard. They are not to gather to excess. Instead, they're asked to have faith that God will continue to provide. What do you think happens? We didn't get to hear the full story in our scripture lesson for today, but if you keep on reading and maybe today after the service, you can go and do so, you'll discover that the Israelites do not follow the instructions. Some of them gather more than they need and the extra food spoils overnight. It's actually pretty gruesome. So God has to repeat the lesson again and again and a few more times before the Israelites really start to get it, really start to trust the process. And this process, this ongoing provision of food that sustains the Israelites throughout their journey is the miracle of manna the miracle of the bread from heaven. And we're actually going to talk about manna next week as well in a bit of a two-part sermon. And it's interesting. Manna is actually, that word manna is actually a play on words. When the Israelites first see this white flaky stuff on the ground, they turn and they say to one another, what is this? What? is this stuff? 
In Hebrew, it's a shorter translation. They say, man, manna, what is this miracle? Who is this God that is providing for us? Manna teaches the Israelites and us two very important things. The first is that there is enough. There is an abundance in creation, a fragile abundance to be sure, and one that we are increasingly at risk of losing entirely if climate change continues unabated, but there is actually enough to sustain all life if we each only took what we needed. If we each followed God's instructions not to hoard, not to collect, to excess, it's a lesson in faith. It asks that we trust the miracle of daily bread. Second, manna teaches us that faith is experienced. We have to dig a little into the original language again here, because it's one of the many, many cases where our English translation just doesn't quite do the original text justice. Verse 12 says, then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. The Hebrew word there that we translate as know actually connotes this embodied experience. It's something physical and lived. In our postmodern, post-enlightenment world, we focus a lot on faith as this cognitive act, faith as knowledge or an intellectual understanding. But this miracle teaches us that faith can be something that comes through our full selves. God is saying you will come to know me. You will rediscover your faith in me through this experience. Every time you wake up and you see that manna, every time you take and eat of it, every time your belly is full, that will show you who I am and how much I love you. Later in Exodus, we learn that the Israelites actually take some of that manna and they put it in a jar. And then they place that jar on the altar. That way, whenever they worshiped, they could see it. They could see it and be reminded of their faith experience. It's like communion, right? Here we have the bread. And here we have the cup. We take communion, not just once, not randomly, but again and again and again to remember our faith. Sometimes, like the Israelites, we find ourselves in a wilderness. We don't feel close to God, or maybe we don't even know if we believe in God anymore. Sometimes we get stuck looking back at the former things and we become fearful of what is to come. That's okay. Because we have communion, we have manna that is provided again and again and again that it might continually remind us of God's presence, God's abundance, and God's love. Thank you.